Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome to the Raja Press Podcast. This is Firoz Manji. At the moment, if people coming from countries like Bangladesh are not being removed. We can stop people coming here in the first place. After days of unrest, the crisis deteriorated over the weekend when a mob attacked a hotel housing asylum seekers. I'll put the staff back in the returns unit. I'll make sure that we've got planes going off, not to Rwanda, because that's, that's an expensive gimmick. They will go back to the countries where people come from. At the moment, even people coming from countries like Bangladesh are not being removed. Some of the mob tried to set fire to the hotel. There were clashes as police tried to keep apart a group of far-right protesters and a much larger anti-fascist counter-protest. On this episode, I speak with Amrit Wilson, writer, feminist and activist, about the rise of racist violence in the UK. As many of our listeners will know, there have been racist uprising across England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and beyond. The trigger for the riots was disinformation. The three small girls stabbed to death in Southport on 29th July had been killed apparently by a Muslim asylum seeker, when in fact the suspected killer was a Brit uh, born in Cardiff to Rwandan parents and is not a Muslim. It is true that right-wing mobilisation and counter-mobilisations have been on an unprecedented scale, but has this not been building up over many decades? How is this related to Brexit, which some suggest that it was essentially the result of a racist mobilisation? Is the presence of people from the former colonies of Britain being in the UK the result of active recruitment to do the shit work that white British workers refuse to do because of the demeaning nature of these jobs, but also the low pay that was offered. And wasn't it the Labour government that introduced the first Immigration Act in Britain? So what has distinguished Labour from the Tories? To discuss this and much more, we have today Amrit Wilson, writer, activist, feminist, and author of a number of books, including Finding a Voice, Asian Women in Britain, published by the Raja Press. A very warm welcome to you, Amrit. Thank you, Feroz. Thank you. As I said, you know, what I think the audience would be interested in is getting an understanding of the background to this event. Because, I mean, anti-black, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim violence has been sort of almost organic to Britain over the last 50 or more years. So what's your take? What is the background to this? Help us understand what the situation in in the UK is. Well, the thing is, you know, um, racism has been very much, a very much a part of British culture, really. It comes out of colonialism, but before that, slavery. And after that, the continuing new colonial wars and so on and so on. You know, that's a given in a way. But what we find also is a kind of reconfiguring of racism to place um, Islamophobia quite centrally to people's experience. That's not to say that all the other kinds of racism against people of African origin, for example, went away, not at all. And that also has increased. But Islamophobia, of course, was part of the colonial legacy. But then we see it being heightened to serve American global interests. And this was particularly noticeable after the war on terror, the so-called war on terror, where we find Muslims targeted as terrorists and a huge number of tropes developed of Muslim men and women and Muslim men particularly were seen as predators in more ways than one. And soon this evolved in a very gendered way. There was, for example, a case of child sexual abuse, not one case, but a case of some 400 children who were abused, girls, in a town in the north of England called Rotherham. Now, Rotherham is also the town where a hotel which was being used to to house asylum seekers, was attacked really viciously 
by the fascists. A few days ago, they tried to set it on fire and they were incredibly violent. And the police were completely outnumbered, as were a small group of counter-protesters. Um, so anyway, Rotherham is an interesting place to look at because Rotherham was where they started this trope of Muslim men as sexual predators. And what we see in Rotherham is a kind of a building up of Islamophobia by the media, by the, the government, and so on. And so essentially what happened was these young girls who were abused, they were largely abused by the sort of small business owners of people who are around at the time of night when, you know, when these things begin. And there was, to an extent, it's true that some Pakistani men were involved. But the trouble was that this was used to attack the Pakistani community as a whole. And people in Rotherham, for example, told me, I wrote an article about this in 2018, and they told me that really it was as though the whole community were sexual abusers, where in fact those who had abused these girls belonged to the community of criminals. And then there was a series, so that what happened next was that there was a report in the Times blowing this up as, you know, these men who abuse young white girls and they're all Pakistanis, they're all Muslims. And um, this was followed up by uh, a series of reports commissioned by the government. And the first two of these reports actually played into this and talked consistently of men of Pakistani heritage being responsible. There was a third report, which was actually uh, commissioned by the police, interestingly. And this report said that something like 67% of abusers were in fact of European or white descent, right? And this last report also said, we're looking for groomers in the wrong place because the majority of criminals who, who groom young girls are not to be found necessarily on the streets. You find that this begins on the internet and it's a, it's a whole, whole other area where abuse can flourish. So this report was completely ignored. And then we have the EDL at that time, the English Defence League, together with another fascist group whose name escapes me at the moment, who had a series of demonstrations through Rotherham, whipping up Islamophobia, terrorizing Muslims, and eventually an old Muslim man coming home from the mosque was killed. He was murdered by the fascists. And the charges were comparatively light against them. And even after this, they were given permission to march through Rotherham. And the Muslim community simply could not take it anymore. So they said they would have a peaceful counter demonstration. The police then channeled that counter demonstration to go past a pub which was known for its clientele who were far right thugs. And of course, there was um, a confrontation. And, you know, surprise, surprise, who got arrested? 12 Muslim men. They were called, they became known as the Rotherham 12. Eventually, they were all released. But even after all of this, we have the MP for Rotherham, Sarah Champion, who's a Labour MP and is still the MP for Rotherham, writing in the sun and spouting the same nonsense. And what's interesting here is, you know, sometime after this, I can't remember the exact date, but there was an attack in New Zealand in Christchurch. It's an attack on a mosque. And the, the ammunition which was used, the killer had written for Rotherham on it. So you can see how global this whole, these tropes are, how vicious this poison is, and how it spreads across the world. 
So, I mean, that is just an example of the way in which Islamophobia has flourished and grown and become, reached these monstrous proportions. And this was utilized by people like Tommy Robinson, who was the leader, who was the leader of the EDL and still continues to be a very central figure for the fascists. This attack against Muslims, Islamophobia, give me an understanding of how this is linked to what is currently happening in, in Palestine and the British government's relationship with Israel. It is very much linked for a number of reasons. One is that the government, the Tory government, and also to an extent the Labour government, have been totally against the Palestine, the pro-Palestine demonstrations. Suella Braverman, who was once the Home Secretary under, under the Conservatives, called them the hate marches. They were supposed to be anti-Semitic and um, people were constantly targeted. This goes back also to the definition of anti-Semitism, which was accepted by the Labour Party and by a number of different institutions and parties in Britain. Under this definition, really any criticism of Israel is regarded as anti-Semitic. Obviously, you know, this became a question of Islamophobia then, you know, because the Palestinians are Muslims. There was a case of a woman who had gone on a demonstration, one of the demonstrations, and she had a placard uh, with Rishi Sunak's picture and Suella Braverman and a picture of two coconuts underneath. And um, this was, she was charged uh, with racism. I can't remember the exact charge, but it's a very heavy one. Her whole life was turned upside down. The sort of threat she received. She had to leave her job. She was pregnant at the time. She had to move house. She had to take her child out of school. So, you know, the, and this case is ongoing. And we, when we protested outside the court, we were told that we should not hold up any placards with coconuts on them. I mean, you know, it beggars belief. Some people had brought coconuts and they had laid them on the ground. The police came and took, the, took them all away. And then they arrested the organizers. I had a, a little placard with me uh, with a picture of a coconut tree and, and said, a coconut by any other name. And um, <laughs> so they came over to me quite threateningly and said, you must put that down. Obviously, the optics wouldn't have been good if they had come and arrested me. But they did threaten me and force me to, like, not hold it up. God. So this is the atmosphere. So, you know, that's how everything is anti-Semitic. And Islamophobia flourishes. So, um, but what's interesting also to go back to the riots is that um, Tommy Robinson is uh, deeply involved with Israel. The Middle East Forum, which was um, led by a former employee of the Israeli Defense Ministry funded the Free Tommy campaign when he was charged. And, you know, he has had charges off and on. And he is currently also being charged with various crimes. And then there's something called the Hertog Foundation, which is also an Israeli foundation, which funds Tommy Robinson. So he's got, he's very well off. He's extremely affluent. And his organization, the EDL, it was actually one of the co-founders who was a man called Paul Ray who worked for Israeli intelligence. Hmm. So you can see how Israel is directing all of this Islamophobia, you know, in a variety of ways. Some years back, they produced a small film for, to be used in women's refuges, which was supposedly about honor killings. And this was Israeli, uh, Israeli funded. And it was incredibly full of errors and incredibly Islamophobic. And it quoted some Israeli writers and just ignored 
all the work done by feminists outside. So, you know, there, there are so many ways in which Israel has penetrated British society, bringing with it this horrific Islamophobia. But having said that, I think Tommy Robinson is also involved with India. What, links with Hindutva? Yes, he's um, thought of as a hero by the Hindutva people. In fact, if you look at the tweets of all of these riots and so on, you have Hindutva people celebrating them, you know. But he's, um, he was pl uh, given a platform on one of the big BJP media things. The Hindutva movement has always linked up and extended the hand of friendship to far-right groups. In the case of Tommy Robinson, it's interesting because a couple of years ago, there was violence in Leicester, where essentially Hindutva mobs attacked Muslims and provoked them. The Muslims also retaliated up to a point, but it was certainly engineered by the Hindutva people who appeared in balaclava helmets and in Muslim areas in, in large numbers and marched through them, shouting Jai Sri Ram, which is on the one hand um, just a greeting, but on the other hand has been used in lynchings, is now associated with violence against Muslims. So mobs were marching through Leicester and Tommy Robinson was urging his um, supporters to, he encouraged his supporters to, to join them. And many people actually say that, that there were far-right, white far-right people on the marches. Um, but obviously one can't be sure because they were in helmets. But, um, but there were some people who definitely thought that they were. But the point is that he encouraged people. And after that, he was totally embraced by the Hindutva media and platformed by um, given an, in, he was interviewed by somebody called Nupur Sharma, who is, uh, you know, a very um, high profile BJP media person, always spouting Hindutva on behalf of Narendra Modi's government. And uh, he spoke about his love for, for Hindutva and he's, he's, you know, tweeted about this as well. So, and now he's planning to, to visit um, India, he says, in December, although he's got a case hanging over his head. So he has left Britain. How he was allowed to leave is yet another question. But um, I think the last he was heard of was lounging in an expensive hotel in Cyprus. Cyprus, yeah. I mean, a lot of the press that we've read about talks about the, the Tories stoking this racism. But isn't it true that your current Labour Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, before the elections was, was talking about sending migrants back to their countries where they come from and that, that people coming from countries like Bangladesh are not being removed sufficiently and that this would change under the, uh, the, the Labour government? Yes, absolutely. Give us some understanding of why there is so little difference between the policies of the Labour government and those of, of the Tories. Well, um, if you look at the um, funding which has been received by the Tory, Tory party, and particularly Tory ministers and people who are in the government, and if you compare that to Keir Starmer's cabinet, a surprising proportion of Keir Starmer's cabinet are also funded by Israel. And uh, he's known to have had, uh, even when he was pretending to be on the left and close, he was in Jeremy Corbyn's cabinet, he was pretending to be on the left and all that. Even at that time, he was secretly having dealings with um, secretive groups, which include the CIA and and big corporates. And, you know, obviously there was an Israeli link as well there. So, you know, he's very much a man of the right. Um, he and David Lammy as well, he's another one. So we, on that level, one can't expect anything from him. He has um, always shown 
extended a hand of friendship to the ultra-right forces in India, uh, certainly the Modi government. And he, his whole policy on, on Israel, I mean, his attacks on the left were that they were anti-Semitic. You know, that was the whole rationale of his um, expulsion of so many, so many, many activists from the Labour Party. So the Labour Party is a changed creature now. But having said that, you know, the Labour Party has a long history of racism. As I think you mentioned, it was the Labour government which passed the most racist immigration laws. And under Tony Blair, we had the war on Iraq and, and much more. So, you know, there is really no very little difference. And what um, Keir Starmer said was interesting because, you know, Rishi Sunak had used the phrase, stop the boats, you know. And this was very much his... Um, that he was going to do this and uh, that, you know, he knew what he was doing and this was almost emblematic of his rule. But when Keir Starmer, they just, you know, the thing you were referring to, his comments, were um, to show that he's actually just as good and in fact better because he, having uh, targeted Bangladeshis, he then said, I know how it's done. I know how to do it. So I'm not expecting anything from him. In fact, I think he may well be worse than the Tories. There was also um, one of his, um, one of the top Labour politicians, John Ashworth, who actually lost his seat in Leicester, who said, yes, Bangladeshis must be returned. And then he also managed to include Indians. So, uh, you know, this was people obviously were not happy because who are these Indians, you know? The um, Hindutva supporting people seem to think they are the only Indians. Although in fact, there's a very large number of Muslim Indians in Britain, people of Indian origin, I mean. You're listening to the Daraja Press podcast. Daraja is the Swahili word for bridge. As its name suggests, Daraja Press seeks to build bridges, especially bridges of solidarity between and amongst movements, intellectuals, and those engaged in struggles for a just world. Check out our other episodes, books, and more at darajapress.com. Now let's get back to the show. We've talked about the sort of huge mobilizations by the right, but I got the impression that there was also a, a considerable mobilization of against the right. Is that a correct impression? Yes, I think uh, there has been, um, there, there have been very big mobilizations. Um, there have been, because people are really, um, you know, they're really angry at what's happening. Um, and, you know, while austerity has led to largely in the increased strength of the ultra-right forces, it has also made people aware that the government is completely useless, you know. So they were certainly there. I mean, a lot of people came out, white people and pe people, activists of different sorts. And there were literally thousands of people who came out in some places, particularly in London. But then also the, when the mosques were, were protected by Muslim uh, men mobilizing. So in that sense, it has been very encouraging to see that. I think the trouble is that there has been no consistent black or South Asian uh, movement for many years. And so, you can protect a mosque, maybe, but you can't protect yourself, you know, when you are on the streets. And there have been two cases of women who had acid thrown at them after all of this, after those mass mobilizations. There's a huge amount of concern and fear and, you know, that because you don't know what will happen. And I think one reason for that is that the communities have not been mobilized or are not fully aware of how they can protect themselves. 
I mean, this happened back in the 70s and 80s too, of course, as you know. But um, the difference now is that there isn't that wide-ranging movement. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about young men fighting each other in groups. At the end of the day, it's not just only about learning how to defend yourself and learning to do martial arts. It has to be about mobilization of numbers. It has to be about the community being able to protect itself. And I think that maybe is happening now, and that's something which is very is a very good thing. But the point is that it hadn't happened for many years. Back in the 70s, when you and I were organizing in, in the UK, there was this idea of black as a political color. It wasn't about being Asian. It wasn't about being Indian. It wasn't a matter of being Afro-Caribbean or African or whatever. There was a real sense, uh, sort of parallel by what was happening in the Black Power movement in the US and this the sense that we were a reflection of imperialism, that it didn't matter where we came from, that we were black as a political color. And there was a lot of organizing amongst black people across Notting Hill, South Hall, and so on. To what extent is that happening now? Well, it's not happening in that way, because for a start, you know, the communities are very different now. Now we have a large number of um, Africans who were not there at the time. They're new people, you know. They don't know that history. We have um, South Asians who are incredibly anti-Black. There were always divisions, but because there were organizations which brought groups together, those contradictions could be dealt with. But those organizations don't exist now. And also people see their identity through the eyes of the market. You know, so it's really all about hair products or, you know, even Bollywood dancing and that kind of thing. And a, the culture is being, you know, being sold on the market to an ex incredible extent. You know, they have South Asian Heritage Month and things like that. And a lot of it really is about the clothes you wear and, you know, and things like that. And, you know, Bollywood plays some a role. So which is, you know, which is something which a movement, if it was there, would have to confront. But these are new issues. They were not there before, to this extent anyway. I mean, that's the difference between now, today, and the 70s and 80s. There's been a huge corporatization of everything. I mean, even if you look at what used to happen in the detention centers in the old days. That was terrible. I mean, for example, the virginity tests. But those things were done by the governments. So they could be challenged. Now these things are being done by corporates. And there's no accountability at all. And it's become a global phenomenon. Like there was a refugee called Jimmy Mubenga who was, he died while, because he was being forcibly deported. He couldn't breathe. And that was done by G4S, which also operates in Israel, also operates in, in parts of India. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, th these, are, these are new issues. One can fight them on the basis of human rights, but that isn't enough, you know. You have to be able to challenge them. And that's another whole new struggle. And also, of course, there's a huge American influence in all of this, you know. Right. We see ourselves more and more as part of the, the diaspora, which includes America, which, and of course, the people who went to America were very different from the people who came here in the 50s and 60s. People came here to work. They were working class. They were basically from a farming peasant background who came here to work in the mills and foundries and factories and so on. 
and the NHS, of course. But the people who come now are IT professionals. And a lot of them also go to America. So their class is very different. And there's huge, huge differences of class within the South Asian community, within the Muslim community. But what kind of community organizing is there that is going on? How are, are, are women from these communities organizing? I mean, you were, you were one of the founders of Awaz, a feminist movement from South Asia. What happened? Uh, is that active? Is there, are there new formations of that kind happening across uh, Britain? Very few. I mean, there are organizations against violence against women, but those, those also are, you know, largely divided about things like abolition or, you know, do you work with the police, do you not, you know, that kind of thing. And also the, those, they set up, you know, the South Asian women in fact, Awad set up the first South Asian women's um, refuge for women facing violence. But that, the way we set it up, the terms we wanted, are, those are no longer there. We have a huge network of refuges now, although many of the South Asian ones have been closed down because of the cuts and so on. But um, those are within the framework of the state. So very little political work is possible. And also very little feminist work is done, you know. There's simply a service, an important service, of course. So, you know, the, that all that doesn't exist anymore. So are you saying that there's been a sort of generalized depoliticization? And to what extent were the, the uprisings and the response to that help contribute to a resurgence of politicization? I think, you know, perhaps we're looking in the wrong place because there has been resistance. Having said, you know, maybe that resistance is not on the lines which we thought of in the 70s and 80s, but there has been and there, there continues to be. For example, there have been cases of refugees facing deportation where activists have come together in huge numbers and actually stopped those deportations. I mean, this is remarkable, you know. And it's more than one case. There have been mobilizations about mutual aid, for example, you know, food, because there's extreme poverty in so many parts of the country, you know. And the whole question of refugees has become center stage. And the people who are activists there, are not necessarily, although some are from the South Asian community or the black community, they don't necessarily, you know, it's not essentially a black, sort of mainly a black thing, you know. And by black, I mean black as we used to know it. Yeah. It includes yeah. many other nationalities, many other groups. The issue of sexuality has become very important. And of course, the ultra-right are also targeting trans people in a very big way. And many of the older activists are not, you know, they need to like adjust to it a little bit more, you know. And all that work needs to be done. But having said that, I think it would be wrong to say that there is no resistance. But it's just that it's different. And yeah. the, the yeah. South Asian communities need to be much more part of it, either part of it or build your own. And that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. People are also yeah. far more religious than they used to be. Not very surprising, given the scale of Islamophobia. Yes. Which also creates a kind of separation really you know although it's not intended then again having said that it's not always the case um, there was a there was a very large demonstration around the Finsbury Park mosque you know and a large number of people went many of them white but then you know we find um, groups like stand up to racism which is essentially an SWP organization 
SWP, the Socialist Workers' Party. Yes, and you know they we have we have known them Feroz, haven't we, from way back, you know. But they, their politics hasn't changed, you know. And uh, at one of these meetings, they were insisting that back in the seventies, the main slogan was "Here to stay, here to fight." A black and white unite and fight. And you know, I I put my hand up because I wanted to say that was never our slogan. We had black people must unite here to stay here to fight. And of course, I was not allowed to speak. So, you know, but having said that, they're on the ground. They're there. So they're pulling out huge numbers of people, including many South Asians, because there is nothing else. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. If you look back at the things that we uh, got involved with back in the 70s and 80s, at that meeting that uh, you also spoke at, talked about, you know, we were Asians, we were Gujaratis, we were Punjabis, we were Muslims, we were Hindus, we were Christians, we were Sikhs, and so on and so forth. Um, and that religion wasn't the, the issue. But you talked about people not knowing that history. But to what extent do we need to own up to that history to make that history known in a way in which we also reflect on our the mistakes we made, the, the failures that we uh, also were responsible for? Might you be able to comment on what you think are some of the weaknesses that we had and why our movements collapsed in the way that they did? Yes, I think uh, that is a very important question. You know, I think that we also fell into the same trap of rigidity, which we blamed our elders for. Rigidity, you know, being big, big very rigid, yeah. you know. Uh, I remember commenting on and always laughing about the way the the IWA were increasingly, they were old men. And IWA, the Indian, Indian Workers, Workers Association. Association. But, you know, in that time, they had done fantastic work. And the trouble was that, you know, the next generation never happened with them. They never became, you know, politically active in the same way. And I think maybe... Why not? Well, you know, when... When there's a dominance of male activists, there is very little, it becomes a man's work, you know. It becomes a man's work, which a man does. And others in the family simply facilitate him, you know. And I think this has happened very much, you know. And I think in the case of many women activists, it didn't happen in the same way. Because when women get involved, then in a way, you know, they have to take their children with them. They can't leave them behind. And I think that was certainly one reason was a kind of inherent unspoken sexism, not the violent sexism, which was also present. You know, we had, you know, sometimes, you know, younger people chat with me and we talk about various activists who they look up to and practically idolize. And then they ask me what their attitude was to patriarchy. And I feel really bad to disillusion them. But if you look at the number of men who actually were violent in those days, it was quite stunning. It's quite stunning. Because this was never an issue. It wasn't an important, it's not seen as an important issue. And while we can now look back and talk about our wars and it was there, you know, we had to fight tooth and nail to be recognized. It wasn't easy. Firstly, there was a very conservative community we were up against. And even other male activists did not really encourage us or, or support us in a fully. It's only when we became stronger that we were given some degree of recognition. And I think all of the, but those things permeate very deep, you know. Whereas now, if you look at the activists, they are, you know, largely female. So many women on the streets. 
Even if you look at the Palestine demos, the young Muslim women. So the whole community becomes politicized, you know. And that's one of the best things about the Palestine marches. I mean, what's happening in Palestine, we can't even fully comprehend the horrors that are unfolding. But on the other side, we have an anti-imperialist movement, which is global. And, you know, th this is very, very important, this, the centrality of this movement to a whole lot of things, including fighting Islamophobia. But the SWP doesn't do that, you know. Stop the war, they, they don't do that. They don't, for example, you know, South Asia Solidarity Group, which, as you know, I belong to, we had tweeted about these, about the riots. And, and we had mentioned, we talked about Tommy Robinson, his links with Israel, his links with India. And they retweet other parts of that message, but they don't, they don't retweet those, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's something else. They don't want it to be mixed up with fighting racism. I mean, I think you've raised a really important point, and, and, and that is that the Palestinian solidarity movement, I mean, in every country around the world, we're seeing huge numbers mobilizing around that. And, you, and you're absolutely right. And it's true in the African protest movements as well. It is women who are in the lead on most of those fronts. But the thing about the Palestinian one, it is, it, it seems to me a, a potential for repoliticization of the discourse that uh, dominates in the in in the West. I wonder, as a sort of final point, whether there are aspects of that that you think will help open up a political response to Islamophobia in the context of a of a of a genocide which is being supported by these advanced capitalist countries. I think it's not just simply, um, one shouldn't say simply, but it's not only Islamophobia. Uh, what, you know, those early days and which have continued and continued and continued when we had these terrible scenes live streamed to us, to our innermost minds, you know, they, you know, made me think, was imperialism always like this? Was this like this in slavery? Was this like this in colonialism? And probably the answer is yes. And I think a lot of people are thinking that, you know. And I think the, the whole question of imperialism becomes extremely important. But it's also important that we don't see it purely in terms of race or Islamophobia, but we see it also in terms of corporate power. Because one can't happen without the other. Absolutely. And I think that's where, for example, in India, you know, we and many other activists are looking at companies like Adani. Adani manufactures drones which are used in India and in Kashmir, and also in Israel. And a whole host of other things which are manufactured by Adani. He was responsible for hoarding the, the agricultural products which, which led to the farmers' movement. I mean, he's, he's going for a, almost a complete takeover of agriculture in India. Isn't it true that they have suffered quite serious setbacks recently in terms of the withdrawal of financing? Well, I mean, he was, um, Hindenburg, who was a short seller from America, exposed him. And uh, he openly said that he, this is one of the worst frauds in corporate history. And now more recently, the security boards of India, which is supposed to, you know, be a kind of watchdog, which was giving Adani a free pass every time. The chair of that that board has been found to have links with Adani Group finances. So where do you go, you know? So Adani is having another of his low points. But, you know, he always tries to pull himself up and, he's, and there's a huge attempt to, at greenwashing him, 
which is happening right here in Britain. You know, they, he has opened a green, so-called green energy gallery in the Science Museum. And, you know, we've got a huge struggle against Adani there, which, which is building up, actually. But so, you know, these are the kind of things which are going on. Yeah. I mean, I think the point that you're making is really important. Uh, and that is that, you know, our governments today are more accountable to the corporations than they are to the, the citizens who may have been participating in electing them. Some final comments, uh, things that you think we, we ought to further reflect on, people who are listening to this, uh, to, to reflect further on. I think um, people should both be aware of what's happening, aware of Islamophobia, use that word Islamophobia, which is not being used enough, but which also shouldn't give up hope. Because while it's easy for us to get into our comfort zones and talk about the 70s and 80s. There's also a young generation who are fighting back. And perhaps they have a lot to learn from us, but maybe we also have a thing or two to learn from them. Indeed, indeed. Keeping hope alive is, I think, a, a really important message to, to go out. We've just published a, a, a book called Palestine Whale by Yahya Lababidi. And if you will permit me just to read a, a, a short poem that he wrote, it's called Hope. Hope's not quite as it seems, it's slimmer than you'd think, and less steady on its feet. Sometimes it's out of breath, can hardly see ahead, and cries itself to sleep. It may not tell you all this, or the times it cheated death, but if you knew it, you'd know how hope can keep a secret. That's so beautiful. It is a beautiful poem. And um, it's so true. Absolutely, absolutely. Amrit Wilson, we'd like to really thank you for sparing time to, to talk about this and to help us understand the dynamics uh, that are de developing in the in the UK, but also internationally, and I think that's been a real, real value in in what you've been saying, is helping us to see this in a global uh, global context. The struggle that we all have facing, uh, wherever we may be. So I want to thank you very much for for being part of this discussion, and I hope we will have further opportunities to to talk again. That was Amrit Wilson from the South Asia Solidarity Group in the UK. Naraja Press had the pleasure of publishing her book, Finding a Voice, Asian Women in Britain, which was the winner of the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize in 1978. You can find out more information about her book and about Naraja Press at narajapress.com. This podcast was produced by Pierre Loisel. Our thanks to Arlo Maverick for the music and thank you for listening.